Well, good evening. We do appreciate you being here. First song this evening, 648. See that? you got to stand up. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Let's sing. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he song will be number 666 I am thine O Lord <clears throat> we'll sing verses 1 and 4 of this song <clears throat> let's sing I am thine O Lord I have heard thy voice and it's all thy love to me but I long to in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee draw me nearer nearer blessed Lord to the cross where thou hast died draw me nearer 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 blessed Lord to reading in our opening prayer this evening was 683. I am mine no more. 683. <clears throat> That's all said. I am mine no more. I am mine no more. I've been is my Lord. 
Jesus is my Lord, and He rules my life. Jesus is my Lord. He will come again. He will come again. And He'll take me home. He will come again. I am mine no more. I am mine no more. I've been bought with blood. I am mine no more. Yeah. <clears throat> this evening's scripture reading comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest, any, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Pray with me. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we humbly bow before Thee, thanking You for this opportunity that we have to come back and spend time in worship to You. Lord, we just are so thankful for this congregation here. We're thankful for each and every person that, that, are, that comes here. We just ask that You be with each of them and fill the needs that they have. Lord, just be with them and, and bless them in all the things that they do. We just thank You for everything that You do for us. We have so many things to be thankful for. We're thankful most of all for your son, Jesus, whom you sent to this earth to live as an example before us, to show his compassion, to teach us how to treat others. Well, we have all of these examples to follow. And that example of being willing to suffer and die upon the cross for each and every one of us, that so we might have that opportunity of everlasting life in heaven with you and with him. We're just so thankful for that. We just ask that you continue to be with us. We have those that are on our prayer list. We ask that you be with them and fill the needs that they have. Those that are recovering, those that are still going through treatments, we just ask that you be with each and every one. Lord, we know that we sometimes sin, we fall short. We ask that you would forgive us from any unforgiven sin that we may have. You would help us to have a forgiving spirit to those that we come in contact with each and every day. Continue with us, guide us and guard us in everything that we do. In Christ's precious name, amen. <coughs> Our next song will be number 642. Let the lower lights be burning. 642. <clears throat> we'll sing verses 1 and 3 of this song. Let's sing. Brightly beams our Father's mercy from His light house Burning 
send a gleam across the way. Some poor fainting, struggling seaman, you may rescue, you may save. Yeah. If you'd like to mark your books, you can do that at page 934. 934, that will be your invitation song at the close of our lesson this evening. Song before Brother Jim brings our lesson this evening, 548. 548, The Lily of the Valley. <clears throat> we'll sing verses 1 and 3 of this song. Let's sing. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. favorite and popular hymns that's still found in our books across the brotherhood is the hymn amazing grace and christians have sung that song for years and our children even know the words to it it's a good song because it's a good topic tonight as we finish out this lord's day together let's talk about this grace of god and some wonderful things about it that are found in Titus chapter 2 beginning in verse 11. So if you're ha you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn over there with me as we'll look at these wonderful things about grace verse by verse. In verse 11, Paul begins by saying, For the grace of God that brings salvation has a period. Now, that's the first wonderful thing about grace. When you see the word grace, many times we think about a favor, an unmerited, undeserving favor of God. We've used that definition forever, and that's a good one. But another word that is very closely associated with this word grace is gift. And this verse says and reminds us that this gift of God, this grace of God, has brought salvation. It has appeared. Well, knowing that it's here where we live, where did it come from? Well, the same sentence tells us it came from God. It was the grace of God that brings salvation that has appeared where we live. Now, that's good because we needed it. Apart from the grace of God, we are in trouble, spiritually speaking. We don't have an answer for our salvation apart from the grace of God. We, we don't have our, uh, our answer to solve the, the sin problem apart from the grace of God. 
So this is, this is wonderful news. That, that God sent His grace to our world and it's connected with salvation which we all need because of our sin problem. And He says, it's appeared. It's here. And so, because of all that truth, we need to look at it. We need to examine this gift. I mean, when you're presented with a gift, what do you do? You, you unwrap it. You look at it. And that's what we need to do with God's grace. Now here at the end of the verse are a few simple words that tell us something else that's wonderful about the grace of God. And that is the fact that it has appeared to all men. This is not a gift for just one person. Now on my birthday, in my family, I'm the only one that gets a gift. And the same thing happens to you on your birthday. And at Christmas, it gets a little broader than that. Everybody in the family gets a gift. But this gift is bigger than you. It's bigger than me. It's, it's designed not only for both of us and all of our families, but it's designed for, the Scripture says here, all men. All men. Now, there is not many gifts that you can think of, special gifts, that are designed for everybody. But the grace of God is. And that makes it even more special. You remember those verses over in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world, all men, He so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever, the whole world, all men, whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And then He follows that with the next verse, 17, For God did not send His Son into the world, everybody, into the world where everybody lives, to condemn the world, but to save the world. God's in the saving business. And there's so many verses in the Bible that remind us of that. Sometimes we, we like to talk more about the condemnation of God than we do the saving part of God. That ought not be the case. God's in the saving business. And we don't ignore the fact that those who don't want to be saved will be condemned. We don't ignore that at all. But our emphasis needs to be on the fact that God has given this world a special gift, His grace in His Son. And this gift is for everybody. It's for you, your family, your neighbors, the people that you worship with every week and the people that you don't are offered the grace of God. It's for the good people. It's for the bad people. It's for the young. It's for the old. It's for the rich and it's for the poor. Uh, Jew, the Greek. It's for everybody. The gift is offered to everybody. It's a special, special gift. That makes it pretty wonderful. But go with me a bit further in verse 12 and verse 13. We're going to learn here in verse 12 in reading the first two words that grace is a teacher. It teaches us just like a, a school teacher, a, a tutor, a, a preacher. It, it teaches us. So if the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to everybody and it's a teacher, then we need to be paying attention to students. What can I learn is the question. What can I learn from the grace of God? Well, in the words that follow here, we learn three things. Number one, the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. That's what it teaches us. You see, God is holy. And in this word, God says, because I am holy, I want you to be holy. But we can't be holy apart from the grace of God. But it, it teaches us to say no, to, to deny certain things in this world to be pleasing to God. 
I think about the lust of this world that John talks about over there in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, 16, and 17. He says, Love not this world, neither the things that are in this world. And he talks about uh, the lust of the flesh. And he talks about the lust of the eyes. And he talks about the pride of life. And, and none of these three things are pleasing to God, so say no to these things. Why? Because they are of this world. And they're not going to last in the next world. So do not enslave yourself to things that are temporary. There's more important things for you to look at and to become. This is interesting when you think about the lust of the world as it pertains to what happened in the Garden of Eden. There was the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life that got Adam and Eve in trouble. It's interesting to think about these things when you think about the temptations of Jesus. Again, all three principles are involved in the temptations that met Jesus in the wilderness. But grace says, you can do better than that. I'm instructing you to say no to anything that looks ungodly, that, that feels ungodly. Just don't be a participant in it. Turn down worldly lust. And if you do that, you've got to fill your life with something else. If you say no to the bad, then he follows this by saying that grace teaches us how to live. It teaches us how to live uh, in, in self-control and, and righteously and, and godly. That's, that's what he says right there uh, in, in this present age. This is how you should live. I remember our Lord talked one time about a man's house was cleansed of demons, but nothing good was put in their place. And because there was an emptiness in the man's house, figuratively speaking, in the man's life, in his heart, uh, the devil came back. And we must realize when we say no to sin, when we say no to things that are ungodly and worldly lust, we, we've got to fill our hearts with something positive. We've got to look for something worthy to live for and to fill our minds with. And so we are to be clear thinkers, thinking about things that are right before God, and we are to be living in the imitation of God. People of self-control and righteousness and godliness. This is what grace teaches us to become. And, and then what do we do? If we devote our life to saying no to Satan, and we devote our life to saying yes to God's plan for us and, and His will, then what do we do? Well, grace continues to teach. Look at this thirdly here in verse 13. Grace teaches us to look. It teaches us to deny. It teaches us how to live. And then it teaches us how to look. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Isn't that why we are what we are? Aren't we looking forward to the day that's going to be different than the days that we live in right now? Aren't we looking forward to a place that's going to be far different than the place we live in right now? Isn't our hope in Christ, knowing that He's forgiven us of our sins as we have come to Him in obedience and faith, covered by His grace, Aren't we anticipating living with God in eternity forever, someday? That is the look of the Christian. The last letter that is found in your New Testament that the Apostle Paul wrote was written to his son in the kingdom, Timothy. And... In 2 Timothy chapter 4, at the end of this letter, Paul talk, talks about what he's looking at. He knows his days on earth are numbered. He knows that he's not going to live much longer. He's been a prisoner for Christ, and he'll die as a prisoner for Christ. 
But here's the advice that he, he talks about to this younger man who's still going to be left behind. He says in verse 6, I'm already being poured out as a, as a drink offering. Now, that goes back to the Old Testament. There were many different kinds of offerings on the altar in the Old Testament days. And one sacrifice was what they called a, a drink offering. And that's when the wine was poured upon the altar until the container was empty. And so figuratively speaking here, Paul says, I feel like the bottle's about gone as it relates to my life. It's about empty. I feel like I, I've had the, the most number of days poured out already. And so he ends the verse by saying, and the time of my departure is at hand. There, there's coming a time when every Christian on earth will pull up the tent pegs and we'll move to a better place. We're going to depart from this earth. It's, it's the promise of God. And as Paul's thinking about his last days and his departure from this earth and how soon it must be, he says in confidence, verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I, I'll just be honest with you. I have fought the good fight. And, and I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. And isn't that what we're all trying to do? We want to fight the good fight. There, there's a war going on every day between God and Satan. And this business of saying, no, I'm not going to do this, and yes, I'm going to do this, that, that's a spiritual battle every day for everybody. But Paul says, I can say at the end of my life, I have fought that battle. And, and I know it, and God knows it. And, and I have finished the race. Uh, Paul talked about athletic contests more than once in his writings. Uh, anybody can start a race, but not everybody finishes the race. And Paul, in his faith, he fought Satan every day and he finished what he started out with Jesus Christ. I have kept the faith. My faith is just as strong as I look at my departure as it was when God called me to be his. Just as strong. And so he says in verse 8, this is his conclusion. He says, Timothy, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. When I read my Bible and study Paul, there are many things in his life that I would wish to imitate. The closeness that he shared with Jesus is something not only to read about and to study, but to imitate, so that you and I can die like he died with confidence and boldness and expecting a crown from Christ himself. He says, I'm looking forward to mine, but let me tell you folks, it's not just me. There'll be one of those for everybody, for all Christians who love his appearing. When you talk about Christ coming back, when you talk about Christ appearing on this earth again, it scares some people to death. They dread the thought of that happening. But the child of God anticipates it. Oh, Lord, come. Come quickly. We are waiting for you. And so grace teaches us to say no. It teaches us to say yes. And it teaches us to look toward heaven. It's a good teacher. Now, when you look at verse 14... Here's another wonderful thing about grace, going back to Titus chapter 2, and that is that grace should make us a thankful people. The last two words in verse 13 were Jesus Christ. And then it says in 14, He gave Himself for us. Now why would you do that? That... I might redeem you from every lawless deed and purify for myself a special people. I don't care how many times you read Scripture that tells you about the sacrifice of Christ. 
I don't, I don't care how many songs you sing about the cross. It never gets old hearing what Jesus did for us. What love demonstrated. What grace abounded when the Son of God left heaven and took on the image of a man and gave his life and his blood that people like me and you can be redeemed from every sin we've ever committed. We can be purified and we can belong to Christ as a special people. If that doesn't drive us to thanksgiving, what would? What kind of grace would you have to receive? What kind of gift would you have to receive to be more thankful than this gift? May I encourage you to daily show your appreciation for the gift. Now what you do on Sunday and what you do on Wednesday night, that's a start. But we need to be appreciative people and thankful people full of gratitude every day that we live. There must not be a day that we let go by that we don't thank God because grace te teaches us to be a thankful people for what we have received. Ingratitude may be one of the most blaring sins that we can commit. But on the other hand, one of the greatest blessings in life is to have this opportunity as a saved person to say to God, thank you. I really appreciate what you've done for me. Grace teaches me to be that person. And then the last thing you see here in verse 14 is that grace will teach us to be a productive people. We're a special people. We just read that, but finish the verse. This special people that's been redeemed and purified in Christ are to be zealous for good works zealous, excited about, enthused about serving Christ. Now, serving Christ is, is not only good for Christ. It's not only good for the people that we help, but it's also good for us as Christians who are trying to be faithful until Jesus comes back to get us. The more that you're involved in the work of Christ, the more you appreciate Christ. And the more that you're motivated to keep on serving and keep on looking for people who need your service. Sometimes people get a little bit confused when you talk about grace and you talk about works and you do so in the same conversation because it seems like either you got grace or you got works, but you can't have them both. It seems like uh, two yoked together uh, unequally. But wait a minute. They do go together. But you must understand this. We're not talking about works of merit. We're not talking about doing stuff to earn our way to heaven. If that's what you're, you're thinking about every time you see the word works, uh, don't go there. Just don't go there. Now some people think, you know, I, I am good enough and, and I, I'll be in heaven someday, completely ignoring Jesus and, and His sacrificial gift. They're going to be so disappointed. There's not a good man on earth, there's not a good woman on earth that can get to heaven based on their own productivity. They're lost without the grace of, of God. But, once we are saved by the grace of God, God doesn't say, take a deep breath and just sit down and wait. He doesn't say that. He says, I'm looking for a people that appreciate what's been done for them and they get busy and they start serving those who are around them. Now, if you go back to Ephesians chapter 2, where our scripture reading came from tonight, this is exactly the conversation that Paul's having there. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. You can't do it. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. But, verse 10 goes on to say, we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Not works of merit, but works of thanksgiving. Works of, of love. Because God has done this for me, I want to do this for Him. We don't serve to get saved. 
We serve because we are saved. And there's a major difference there. If you think that you can add up the points enough to get you to heaven, you'll never, ever feel secure in your salvation. Because you'll never feel like you can do enough. You won't be able to, to, to bake enough cakes. You, you won't be able to sit with enough sick people. You won't be able to preach enough sermons. You won't be able to give enough money. You won't be able to... You just can't add up the points and say, this is all I need to do to get to heaven. It's not about earning your way to heaven. It's about appreciating the one who's opened the door to heaven through the name of grace. In Christ Jesus, His Son. And being excited about that and zealous about that, so much the so that you tell people about Jesus, so much the so that you hand out what you can hand out to people to help them, and you do what you can to the best of your ability to represent God in a very ungodly world. Well, I might say that's your homework this week. That's mine too. Let people see the grace of God in your life as you serve. There's a verse that certainly never leaves my thinking. And it's 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1. Every time I talk about grace, I, I feel like I, I've got to mention this verse where Paul said, we, we plead with you. Literally, I'm begging. We plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now, I'm very happy tonight that just about everybody in this room, as far as I know, has received the grace of God. You're a Christian. And I'm happy you've made that decision. And God is happy that you've made that decision. And it will never be said about you that you received the grace of God in vain. You took it for what it was worth. You are enjoying it. And in the passage that follows this one, you know, today is the day of salvation. And that day of salvation is very real in your life because you are a child of God. And I commend you for that great decision in your life. Let the grace of God continue to live through you until He comes for you. But if there was anyone in this room tonight or anyone listening to us tonight that has not yet received the grace of God for what is worth, I would plead with you to change your mind and to see the importance of saying no to your sin, repentance, we call that, and yes to Jesus, we call that obedience. Confessing His name among men and in front of heaven itself, asking to be immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of every sin you've ever committed if you're not a Christian tonight and you're listening, let me tell you, God loves you. And you're one of the world. And you're one of all men who has the invitation of God to receive His grace through obedience. Read your Bible. Study your Bible to develop faith in your life. Listen to the wisdom of those who are God's people around you. And let that faith, as it develops, lead you to personal obedience to Jesus Himself. Do not receive His grace in vain. What a waste if you go through your whole life and never become a Christian. What a waste of the most precious gift that's ever been sent to this world. The Bible says, Whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Maybe that's you this evening. If it is, will you come as together we stand and sing? Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting and watching. For you and for me, come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is.
sing the first verse. If you need to take that, come down and you'll be served. Let's sing. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow. Lead me to gracious and loving Heavenly Father, so again we thank you for an opportunity to gather around this table. This time I'd like to offer thanks for the bread to which us as Christians serves as a reminder of the body of Christ as he hang upon the cross for each and every one. Be with these who partake this, they can do so in a manner that is pleasing to you. In Christ's name. Continue our thanks, Heavenly Father, for the cup, the fruit of the vine, to which us as Christians serves as a reminder of the blood that was shed there upon the cross for each and every one of us. Again, be with these that partake this, they can do so in a manner when pleasing in your sight. In Christ's precious name, amen. It's good to have you here this evening. Appreciate very much you being here. I want to uh, remember those that we have on our prayer list. Um, men, we've got a uh, business meeting following our service this evening, so remember that. Uh, we've got our homecoming coming up. Uh, Jim and Octavia will be with us for that. That's April the 16th through the 19th. And that is three weeks? Three weeks from today. Okay, so uh, you've got time to get out some flyers. There's some out there. If we need to run some more copies, we'll be happy to do that. Let's send out and invite as many folks as we can. We'd like to get uh, uh, a lot of folks here for that. We'll be having a fellowship meal following our morning service, so remember that. Again, is there any updates or anything that we need to know about, about anybody that might be on our prayer list? I'm sure we've got some spring break coming up, so we've probably got some folks that are going to be traveling, so... Uh, be praying for those that might be traveling. Uh, there's nothing else. Skip through that last one. We'll sing 129, Amazing Grace. We'll sing a couple of verses of that before we're dismissed. <clears throat> verses 1 and 4 of that song. 
You'll get a song book. You don't have to have that unless you don't need it. Let's stand as we sing. 129. It's not on there. You're going to have to go through. There you go. There you go. Okay. Let's go. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. We to sing God's praise then when we first begun yeah. Oh my God our Heavenly Father we thank you for this another good approach that you've given to us Father we thank you for our hand your past time and I sing these songs to hear another great lesson from our Lord. Father, we can not pray for those who are prayer this, pray for our congregation, pray for those that's had a test run, and Father, we pray for those that's lost to other ones. Father, we ask you now to go with us, guide the government directors, when our life is over.